I'd like to introduce Jeremy Bartley, who's going to walk us through smart mapping. All right. Thank you. Thank you, sir. That was great. Uh, so great to see everybody here. This is, a, this is amazing. Um, I love maps. That's why I got into geography. That's also why I came to Esri. You know, last year, we released smart mapping at the last developer summit. And smart mapping is all about improving and simplifying the authoring experience. Uh, for creating thematic maps. And what we discovered is, is once you improve that experience, um, you start to use it to understand patterns that you may not have seen, so be able to explore your data interactively. Um, and that's really what it starts with. It starts with your data. So I've got this feature layer here. We're looking at voting patterns. I see things like uh, Republican votes, Democratic uh, Party affiliation, uh, whether or not they attended a rally, whether or not they voted in the last year. This is all data. And what we want to turn this data is into useful information. So by jumping into the smart mapping panel and picking one of the attributes, like let's say uh, party affiliation Republican, immediately I'll get a beautiful map that's a, a color ramp that's applied to my data. I don't need to be a color expert. Color Bureau, Bureau is sort of built into the box for you. Um, it works across multiple base maps. So if I pick something like, let's say, the dark gray canvas, we're going to pick a color ramp that's going to work well with it. <clears throat> Not just working with color, but I can also work with size. Uh, this is going to apply a size for each of the features based on the data. And this not just works at one scale, but notice how I zoom in and the sizes get bigger. This is working for you right out of the box at multiple scales. Now, if I drill in, this is where it starts really getting exciting to explore the data. So I see this, this distribution. This is kind of what you are going to see when you have a count type data set. And it's really just showing population centers. But if we go in here and let's say normalize by who actually is participating, so who voted in the election, I'll get this nice normally distributed histogram. And what's interesting about that is I can choose to apply uh, the size at whatever data value I want. So I might say I want to, I want to look at uh, everything that's 49% uh, which is the average for this data set, 49% uh, Republicans. So the smallest dots will be 49 or less, the biggest dots will be 74%, and then we'll just scale in between. This gives you a good spatial pattern of where you have uh, current Republican voters. Now, it's not just mapping uh, one variable, but we're looking at multiple variables. So let's say I'm looking at median household income. <clears throat> and I drop down and look at another variable like the total number of households. Notice how this drawing style options changed for me. That color and size as an option went away and now I get a color and size option uh, where we apply the color to median household income, we apply the size uh, to the total number of households. Let's apply that same pattern back to uh, our Republican data set. So here I've got the median household income is, is driving the color and the size is the one we just created, which is the percent active Republican voters. <clears throat> I can go in here and flip through many of these variables. Like maybe I want to see who's contributing uh, cash to a political organization, or uh, who's really active, who's passionate, who's attended a political rally or a protest, and has also declared themselves as a Republican voter. Again, I can still go in here and control the details to change how I'm applying that data. Like in this case, I may want to normalize it and just get really the ones who vote are the ones that really care about. Uh, so these are the uh, voters who, uh, the recent voters who have actually attended a political rally who consider themselves Republican. And we see that the color ramp, the, the style that's applied is from high to low, but I can easily go in and pick something like uh, above and below. This is going to be above and below the national average. So then I start to see some pretty interesting patterns. So areas in green are areas where Republicans, um, they declare themselves Republicans and they vote, but they don't really like go out to political rallies. Areas in red, they do much more go out to political rallies uh, as compared to the rest of the data set. Now, it doesn't just start, stop with two variables, but notice how when I start to work with multiple variables, like let's change this to Republican, uh, Democratic, and add, uh, oops, wrong one, add a, uh, oops, wrong one. 
There we go. Let's add uh, independence. <clears throat> and notice how my style changes. I get some new options, a predominant category. This lets me look at two or more variables, and it'll help me find out what's the most common type of uh, variable or attribute for that feature. So I see uh, the, the Democratic areas in blue, the Republican areas in red, and the independents in green. And then notice it's not just the color, but it's also the strength of the color, or how predominant is it within that area. Uh, this is a very simple way for you to start to really exploring patterns in your data that you may not uh, think that are there. And it's not just about me creating this and using it for myself. I want to save it as a map, and that map then can share throughout ubiquitously throughout the platform or to your developer, uh, your applications that you develop. And to talk about web maps, I'm going to turn it over to Justin. Thanks, Jeremy. So today I'm excited to show you some work that we've been doing to update our web map spec. So why is this important to us? Well, as we'll see throughout the morning, the map is a central component of the ArcGIS information model. And as developers, it's a key entry point for discovering the capabilities of the platform. So if we look at the spec, we can start with the map, where we can easily see a list of all of its properties. And as we drill down, we can see information about the objects that make up the map and examples of their JSON. Now, this documentation is one of the formats we're going to be releasing the spec in. But we're also going to be releasing the spec as something called JSON schema. JSON schema is a tool for formally describing JSON data. And with our spec in this format, we can easily do validation. We can generate the documentation that we saw. And actually, we're also generating our source code that we're using for reading and writing of maps. We're going to be releasing the web map spec on GitHub in the coming weeks, and the web scene spec to follow that. Back to you, Jeremy. All right, thanks, Justin. That's amazing, you know, getting that web map spec up, and up on GitHub with the web scene to follow. Um, that just tells you how important a web map is to us. You know, this is the document that we share across all of our applications, from Pro to Collector to Explorer to browser-based applications. And what you're going to see this afternoon or later this morning when uh, Will and Jan talk about the 4.0 JavaScript API and the Quartz API is that they've made incredible strides in to be able to develop against that web map and that web scene. The development experience is just going to be amazing. So, and that's what it is. You take this map and you want to use it everywhere. So if I go over to a simple sample and uh, I'll put that web map ID in and run it, it's going to bring that, that layer that I just authored, that map that I just authored back up for me. Yeah, so smart mapping is a way for you to uh, understand your data, to have confidence to build great maps. And web maps give you the, po the power to be able to not just keep it for yourself, but to share it everywhere. And to tell you about 3D and how uh, we can do that with 3D as well, I'd like to introduce you to Russ Roberts. Thanks, Jeremy. Hello, everyone. I'm going to show you how I'm going to take this report by the USGS that covers the Monterey Bay off the coast of California, and I'm going to develop a 3D scene in ArcGIS Pro. I'm going to then share it to ArcGIS Online, and I'm going to use that new functionality that came in the update to ArcGIS Online last week and create a rich 3D web app using Web App Builder's new support for web scenes. So here in Pro, I've already started the scene. And you can see that I already have some detailed elevation added. This elevation data is coming from my own elevation service, which I created with the bathymetric data from the USGS report. I published it to my ArcGIS server, and then I added it into Pro. I also added in a geology layer and styled it to match what it was in the USGS report. So the next thing I want to do to this scene is clip its extent. So I'm going to clip the extent to the geology layer. And this will help keep my audience focused on just the canyon area. And the extent that I'm clipping it to will also be used in the web scene that gets created when I publish it to ArcGIS Online. So here we have that scene updated with the clipped extent. The next thing I want to use, I want to add in some sediment sample data that was collected by the USGS. But I want to use 3D symbols. I can use some preset 3D symbols easily in Pro with just a few clicks. So I'm going to select my sediment samples. I'm going to use the centered spheres. And with these uh, preset symbols, I can actually drive it by the attribute data within, uh, within the sediment layer. So I'm going to use the percentage of sand that was measured in the samples to drive both the color and the size. 
Now I'm going to apply a slight scale change so that way we can easily see it on the scene. And there we go. There's our 3D spheres added in to our, our, our scene. And we can see right away that it looks like the samples towards the landward side have a high concentration of sand. While as you get to the center of the scene, we can see that it drops off significantly. And this is where the mud belt exists within the canyon. Now I'm going to share this scene to ArcGIS Online. So when I share this scene, this scene to, Arc, to ArcGIS Online, it'll create a web scene. It'll also create new hosted feature layers from the layers that I had added to my scene. It's going to preserve that extent that we've clipped it to. And it's also going to use the exact same elevation service that I have here in Pro. So I just need to give it a title. Give it a little summary. and some tags. Now, just to save some time, I'm not going to make you guys watch me uh, share the scene to ArcGIS Online. I already have it ready in my browser. And here's that same scene that we had here in Pro with that exact same extent using the same elevation service and 3D symbols. In the scene viewer, I can also create my own web scenes or I can update them. So in this case, I want to add some slides to this web scene. I can easily capture slides, which capture the camera angle. It also preserves stuff uh, like layer visibility. And if I was using any of the environment settings, like sun position, time of year, that also gets captured. Now I just need to save my scene to apply my changes. And now I want to bring it into a web app. So new with that, what I mentioned before, new with the recent update to ArcGIS Online is the ability to create rich 3D web apps using either our templates or using Web App Builder. I'm going to use Web App Builder today. So underneath my content, I go to Create, App, and I'm going to use Web App Builder. Now I just need to select the 3D option, give it a title, add some tags, and we'll launch Web App Builder. Now, in just a few clicks, I'm going to create a rich 3D web app. So I, just need, I can choose my theme. So I'm going to use the foldable theme. I'm going to update my toolbar color and just adjust the layout quickly. Next, I want to use that local scene that we are using in the scene viewer. So I'm just going to choose it. And this will load in that same web scene that we saw in the scene viewer. Extent is there, the elevation data is there, the symbols that we were using, everything has been preserved. Now I'm going to add in, uh, uh, edit the widgets. So in Web App Builder, you have the ability to add and remove widgets or create your own. I'm going to remove the environment which, are, which controls the sun position or the uh, time of year, because I don't want my audience that's going to be using this web app to have that control. And as the 4.0 JavaScript API matures, there's going to be more widgets coming to our 3D web apps. Now I just need to update my attribution. And here I'm going to apply my branding. I just want to save my changes. I'm going to launch that web app that we were just working on. And here's our final product. We just created a rich 3D web app using a scene that we authored in ArcGIS, in ArcGIS Pro. We edited it in the scene viewer and online. And then we created a rich 3D web app in just a few clicks. And we can see those slides that I added are still there. And the elevation data is present as well. Thank you very much. Please welcome Dean on the stage to talk about the content that's available on ArcGIS, to ArcGIS. Great. Thanks, Russ. Thank you. Good morning, folks. So one of the aspects of the ArcGIS platform that makes it really powerful for developers is that it includes a rich set of ready-to-use online content and services that you can access. This content includes maps, layers, and tools that are available to you through your developer subscription. When we think about our content, we like to think about it as a living atlas of the world, which includes maps and layers from Esri and thousands of other contributors. This is a curated subset of all the public content that's available through ArcGIS Online that's organized by various thematic categories, like base maps, 
imagery, demographics, or more. This content is growing and changing on a daily basis as new content is added and existing content is updated, sometimes as often as every few minutes with things like real-time traffic and weather. So where does this content come from? Of course, a lot of this content is being published by Esri. We'll talk about that in a minute. But increasingly, content is being published by Esri partners, organizations like NearMap and Hexagon that are publishing very high resolution, very recent imagery into the platform, which is available through the marketplace. And also, a lot of the content these days is coming from our user community, organizations like NOAA that are publishing real-time information like weather and radar. So let's talk about Esri's content. Esri offers a rich set of maps, layers, and tools that you can use for both visualization and analysis. Many of you are probably familiar with our base maps, which continue to grow in popularity and usage, but we also offer many other types of content, such as detailed demographic data for the United States and other countries around the world, and real-time information like traffic or transportation access, which is updated constantly. Many of you are also very familiar with our world imagery base map, which is probably our most popular map. But we also offer many other types of imagery, multispectral, multi-temporal imagery that you can use not just for visualization, but for analysis and to look at things like healthy vegetation or impervious surface. And we provide a number of other layers that describe the physical and natural landscape of our planet. One of our more popular types of content these days is our world elevation map, which we continue to update with more and more detailed content. And it's used both for 2D visualization, like this multi-directional hill shade you see here, but also for 3D visualization in apps like Scene Viewer, Pro, and ArcGIS Earth, and also can be used for analysis. And we also offer a number of real-time services like active hurricanes or active recent earthquake events and si other seismic activity. One of the products that we're most excited about this year is our new vector base maps. This is a new suite of base maps which will complement the existing base maps that we make available. This content will be built from the same source data that we use for our existing base maps, so it will include all of the authoritative data that our users have been contributing to us. This content will come in various map styles. Esri will have a suite of about eight map styles that we make available. Some will be familiar to you, like our streets or topographic map. Other styles will be new, like streets at night and navigation and our new imagery hybrid map. And you'll be able to customize these styles to make them suit your application requirements. You'll be able to turn layers on and off, change symbols, switch language between global and local languages, and even do things like change the representation of disputed boundaries. And one last point on this, as with our existing base maps, these new vector base maps will be freely available to all ArcGIS users and developers. So how do you access this content from the Living Atlas? It's, con it's content that's built into all aspects of ArcGIS. There's not intended to be one user experience. It's meant to be accessible in multiple ways, through ArcGIS Online, through ArcGIS for Desktop, the new ArcGIS Pro 1.2 release has built-in access to the Living Atlas, and also through a variety of custom apps. So let me just give you a quick tour of how you can do that. So here I am signed into my ArcGIS Online subscription, and I've gone to the gallery of Esri featured content. Here you can filter the content by different categories. So if I were looking for one of these new vector base maps, I could go to base maps and Esri base maps, and here I'll find our topographic map. This is one of our new vector base maps. I can open that up within the map viewer, and it'll zoom to the default extent. I can zoom into an area like where we are here. And you can get a sense for the content. In this case, we're looking at our topographic map overlaid on our multi-directional hill shade. If I want to add more layers to this map, I can do that from the Add button. And there's a built-in dialog for browsing layers from the Living Atlas. So if you select that, Again, you can look at specific categories of content. In this case, maybe I'm interested in adding something for traffic, get a sense for what the traffic's like. I can filter content by Esri content only if I want. And then I can simply click and add these layers to the map. So all of these Living Atlas layers are available at your fingertips, and I would encourage you to use the map viewer and the gallery to get to these web maps and layers because they're all ready-to-use authored content. 
One other example of a map that's available, this is one of our demographic maps. This map of Palm Springs is showing median disposable income. So I can see that on average, Palm Springs is pretty typical. There are a few areas that are below the norm and a few areas that are above the norm. If I want to inspect those a little more, I can select one of them and get more detailed pop-up information that's been authored into the ready-to-use layers. Another similar example, this is looking at current wind and weather conditions for the United States. I can zoom into an area of interest, such as Southern California, and then I can interact with a map to get detailed information that's been built into the pop-ups into the web maps. So hopefully this gives you a good sense of the variety of content that's available through ArcGIS and through the Living Atlas. Next, we'd like to tell you a little bit about some of the new capabilities that are available for you to publish your own data. And here to tell us about vector tiles, please welcome Edie Punt. Thanks, Dean. Multi-scale maps have become ubiquitous in our digital age. We expect, and in fact demand, a smooth transition to increasing levels of complexity as we zoom into maps on our computers and our mobile devices. For several years, Esri has provided worldwide multi-scale base maps for you to use to showcase your content. Traditionally, these have been delivered as pre-rendered image tiles. Recently, we've introduced beta versions of some of our base maps in vector tile format. Here, I'm showing two, the world navigation map and the light gray canvas layer. Vector tiles are efficient to draw and store. They're rendered client-side from vector geometry so that the content looks crisp even on high-resolution displays. More importantly, vector tiles can be restyled independently of their <coughs> creation. These two base maps are built from one set of tiles, each leveraging its own style file. And what that means is I can, I can make a copy of any of these uh, vector tiles and customize them for my own use. So I'll make a copy. So to make it my own, I simply access the style file. I can work with the native JSON code, or I can use an interactive editor. Here's an example of one that we've written that you can access freely. So I'll go ahead and choose the copied layer I just made. And I'm going to make a simple change just to the color of the land. I'll choose a different color, apply the style, and save. Now I can use my newly customized layer in a web map. I'll add it to a new map. And you can see that the simple change I made to the land color is respected throughout all the scale ranges. Now I've got my very own custom base map that I can use without having to store or manage any base map data. But perhaps you have your own data and you want to make your own vector tiles. That's where ArcGIS Pro comes in. Vector tiles are produced in ArcGIS Pro 1.2 using the open map box vector tile specification. ArcGIS Pro is where you manage your data, where you author a map to your specifications and generate a vector tile package. I'm going to get that started right away. It'll take about a minute or so to process. So I input my map. I have a map of updated streets for Iceland. I input it into the Create Vector Tile Package tool, and I run the tool. And while that's running, I'm going to outline some enhancements we've made to multi-scale map authoring. So traditionally, when you built multi-scale maps, you made a lot of different group layers based on the scale ranges, applied visibility ranges, and definition queries to each. It was a lot of content, duplication, and a lot of effort. With ArcGIS Pro 1.2, you can adjust the visibility range of individual symbol classes. And I'm going to show you an example using the roads layer. So I'll open the symbology pane. 
And roads are symbolized by unique value, which means we have a different symbol for each road class here. If I switch over to the scale range view, you can see that I can work with the scale ranges for all these different road classes. And right now, I can see that the minor roads, the white ones, are being shown at all layers in my multi-scale map. And this is simply too much detail at the smaller scales. So I'm going to adjust the visibility range of those to just limit them to the larger scales. Not only is this a more effective depiction of the roads, but it makes for more efficient vector tiles too. So let's check on the progress of my package. The Create Vector Tile package has been, tool has finished and the package is ready for me to use in ArcGIS Online. When I upload a vector tile package, I have, I can also pub, choose to publish the, t the file as a vector tile layer. And in the interest of time, I've done that here. Here's the vector tile package I've made, and here's the tile layer. It's this tile layer that I'm going to use in my map. So here I've got a web map ready to go. I've got earthquakes symbolized by magnitude over top of our new multi-directional hillshade. And I want to add my updated Iceland streets as a new vector tile layer. So I'll just search for that and find these are the new vector tile layers that I just created. Now you can see that they come into my map as a new multi-scale layer and all of the symbology, scale ranges, and transparency that I set in ArcGIS Pro are respected throughout. I can use vector tiles across the platform. Using configurable templates, I can consume my vector tiles inside a web app without writing any code. There are numerous templates available. I can select any of these and write an application around my map. Using just the basic viewer, I created one here in a matter of moments. And I can even use these vector tiles through a runtime app on my iPad. Labeling is dynamic in vector tiles, so the place names stay upright even as I rotate the map. Vector tiles, tiles draw quickly and require less storage. They're even quick to generate. They're crisp on high resolution displays and they support dynamic labeling. They can be restyled so you can make more than one map from a single set of tiles and you can copy and customize one of our new vector tile maps or create one of your own using ArcGIS Pro. Thanks. I'm going to hand it over to Justin now, who's going to talk to you about mobile map packages. Thanks, Edie. So today, I'd like to take a look at how we can use mobile map packages to support your workflows of moving maps and data from the office into the field. We're going to start in ArcGIS Pro where we author our map and create our mobile map packages. So here I have the start of my map. It has my wind turbines and a custom access road network. Some typical data an organization doing turbine inspection or maintenance might have. As I zoom out, I can see I have more of my data, the symbols change and, and labels turn off, but to actually make this map useful, I need to give it more context. Now, I could simply add in one of the Esri base map layers, like one of the vector tile layers we saw in the previous demo. And that's great for some workflows, but I know I want my map to support more capabilities not possible with layers. So I'm going to use the Esri Street Map Premium data set. Esri Street Map Premium comes with layers that I can add to my map, and it comes with a transportation network that I can incorporate my roads into for custom routing. Also in my project, I have a locator that I created for finding turbines. So now that my map is authored, we can create our mobile map package. I select the map, I choose the locator from the project, 
and I could specify an area of interest. As we package the map, its layers, their data, the locator, the transportation network, everything is included. And the package that I get, I can share as an item, or I can save locally to sideload onto my device. And as we switch over to my mobile device, we can see that we have the same map. Now, the app that we are looking at is Navigator for ArcGIS, an app built with the ArcGIS runtime that uses mobile map packages. Now, since I've previously downloaded the package to my phone, we can actually work offline with all of our layers still accessible. As I pan and navigate the map, we can see that we have the same labeling and same symbols we authored in Pro. If we'd like to find a specific turbine, I can use the included locator. And as I enter in a turbine ID, we can actually see that I'm getting back matches based on my input. And that's because our locator was created with the suggestion capability enabled. And that allows us to build responsive user experiences like this. So all the data that we see on our map are features stored in a compressed mobile geo database. And because we didn't tile our data as we created our package, we didn't lose any of their capabilities. Their geometries are still available to do things with like analysis. We could still do an identify and bring back their attributes to show in a pop-up. Or if we generate a route with the included transportation network, we can get turn-by-turn -turn directions with the street names, rate to our wind turbines, along our custom roads. So mobile map packages provide a great way to be able to package up your maps and data to use inside of your applications built with the ArcGIS runtime. 